Here we are again with another Muscombe History Group Lockdown Special. I hope these programmes are helping to keep us together whilst we're being forced to be apart. The way out of lockdown seems to be getting more complicated, but it still looks like next year before our meetings can start again. If there's a topic you would like to see in the series before we get back together, let Brian know and we'll see what can be done. But I'm prepared to take a bet now. I bet you get bored before I do. This one is another celebration of a local history. The search for black gold. Coal has probably been used as a fuel for almost as long as humans have been able to control fire. Almost everywhere in Europe there were places where coal seams break through to the surface and coal could be picked up from the ground. Early humans appeared to make a habit to throw rocks into the fire and see what happened and they couldn't help but notice that this rock burnt away. What's more, it made the fire much hotter. And there perhaps we have our first coal gatherers. Members of the tribe looking for the strange black rocks while seeking berries and other game. Even the ancients would quickly realise that coal was an efficient fuel. And it wouldn't take long for the more ingenious members of the tribe to realise this black rock was a very good way of keeping fire alive as they moved from place to place. Coal carried in a multi-layered basket or similar will smoulder for a very long time. Jump to a more civilised age and we can see craftspeople who rely on heat for their skills to shine, making use of easily found coal. And perhaps coal became an article of trade very early in human history. As with most supply and demand situations, the more the product is needed, the harder it becomes to find. Coal that you could pick up would not last long once the demand increased. But that's not a problem. Where coal used to be on the ground, you just have to dig a little and you can find tons of it. Coal was definitely being mined in the Bronze Age. This would probably bring about an early us and them society. You must dig it and I will sell it. And it wouldn't be long before it was ho slave dig there and keep digging until I say stop. This is my mine and you are my slaves. There are those in my family who would say that it stayed like that for the next three or four thousand years. Very few of the people who burned coal went to mine coal and almost none of the people who owned the land under which the coal could be mined went down the mine to get it. Britain's great and glorious social history almost always meant the coal owners and the coal miners would be vast worlds apart. Sometimes a farmer or a smallholder would find coal on the land he farmed and would from time to time dig out enough to heat his fires and his ovens through the winter. 
Sometimes he might dig out enough to trade with his neighbours for some product of theirs. He might be called an owner miner, but his rights to hold the land would be tenuous. If coal measures came, became profitable, the land ownership would usually change in favour of the lord of the manor. And so it would have been in Nottinghamshire, where coal has been mined for many centuries. First, it was simple surface mining. But from the 1270s, coal was probably being mined at Cossel and Selston. Certainly, shaft mining was taking place on a significant scale at Selston in the reign of Edward I. A mining at Cossel is again documented in the mid 14th century. The Carthusian House of Religious Brothers at Beauvale records a particular connection with coal mining at Newthorpe, Selston and Kimberley in the reign of Richard II. The Nottinghamshire coal fields were becoming established. The records show that the Carthusian brothers retained a mine owner's interest in coal mining until the dissolution of the monasteries. They were making money from a mine at Kimberley and drawing rents from a mine at Selston. And it was around the time of Henry VIII that coal became more difficult to find and the idea of mining deeper, sinking shafts, making drains and using timber for props gradually gained acceptance. These included the use of the sow, a method of draining a mine by using gravity, a real-life candidate for Bunyan's Slough of Despond. Already there was a ready, regular and considerable demand for coal from Nottingham by the 15th century. Perhaps the Carthusians were particularly astute, or perhaps they simply wanted funds to minister to the poor and help the sick and the aged. But whatever their motive, the Carthusians at Beauvale recognised the market for coal in Nottingham gave them a valued commodity. And in 1457, they sold a portion of their rights to coal at Newfield to the Prior of Lenton on a lease for seven years. There seems to be little in the records that tell us how this coal was won, but it's probably safe to assume that few of the brothers went doom pit to fetch it. However, with Henry VIII's dissolution of the Roman Catholic Church, the brothers, whether for good or ill, lost control of their part of the Nottinghamshire market for coal. From the 16th century, mine workings, using new methods, were able to take coal from further below the surface by sinking deeper shafts. But there were still many natural restrictions to overcome and they were still only shallow mines that were worked. Only coal quite close to the surface was worked out, and as the mine became too difficult to work, the miners simply moved to another area, rather than mining deeper. This was partly because there were plenty of shallow surface seams to be worked, but mainly because the technology of the age did not allow mines to be drained of water. The deeper the mine was dug, the faster it filled up with water. Miners who were casual itinerant workers may have had a tramp of many miles to find their next work, but those who were tied to a master might not be any better off. 
The masters often had a multitude of ways of keeping their workers under control. Tied houses, company stores, forced loans, equipment higher costs, sick pay debts. It was a life of long working hours, short leisure time, unpleasant working conditions and woe betide any troublemakers. Whilst all the time there is the threat of instant death or permanent maiming injury in a rockfall, an explosion or an accident. In the whole of the history of mining it can never be a totally safe place of work and most miners carried the coal's tattoo where coal dust had healed into cuts and grazes on their bodies leaving a permanent blue-black mark that often itched and sometimes turned very nasty. Mining began to develop around Woolerton towards the end of the 15th century. And by the 16th century, Woolerton and Strelly had become busy mining areas. The mines were beginning to make huge profits for the owners. The Willoughby family of Woolerton began to enter into open and violent competition with the Strilly family, who from around 1530 were opening new mines around their manor at Strelly. Sir Henry Willoughby, as Lord of the Manor of Woolerton, had been given the rights to mine coal within his manorial holdings by the Prior of Lenton, and to make a sow from his own coal mines through various lands of the Priory so as to remove water from his mines. The dissolution of the monasteries reserved rent to the King, and for Sir John Willoughby this was commuted to twelve shillings a year. By the reign of Edward VI, the Strullies thought this was an unfair competitive advantage. Subsequently, the Strullies were accused of deliberately diverting water into the Willoughby's mine in an attempt to ruin their trade. As mines became even harder to work, but the prophet gods still insisted that the seams were worked and gangs of men were still prepared to hew the coal. So much so that in early 1550s Henry Willoughby of Woolerton sought permission to make a new sow on land that was now owned by Edward VI. He was significantly increasing the mining on his Wollaton land. It wasn't long before Sir Francis Willoughby, of a later generation of Lords of Wollaton Manor, was entering into a new commercial arrangement. The stone quarries from Lincolnshire would receive a supply of coal to sell in the county. Partly in return for the supply will be a supply of Ancaster stone with which Sir Francis could face and embellish his residence at Woolerton Hall. Of course, there was also a hard cash component of this deal and it was a further example of how commercially successful the Willoughbys were becoming. The Strullies were much less successful and by 1620 had mortgaged their mines to London merchants, who subsequently foreclosed on them. As the county moved into the 17th century, almost every owner of a substantial packet of land would be prospecting for coal. Even Nottingham Corporation was putting in some trial borings for coal on land that it owned. 
The corporation was still actively trying to find coal in the 1630s by funding a prospecting programme on wastes and woodlands in its ownership. Coal was becoming King Coal as more and more fledgling industries began to use coal as an energy source that would eventually power an environmental revolution. By the beginning of the 17th century, coal mining had become one of the most important industries in Nottinghamshire. By 1720, new mines had opened in the Hucknall area and there was a new motivation in the land. Most Nottinghamshire coal was sold locally to Nottinghamshire people. But Nottinghamshire people were beginning to realise that it could all be done more profitably. Suppose I bought a tonne of the material needed for some craft or commodity here to Nottingham, rather than transporting 10 or 20 tonnes of Nottinghamshire coal to wherever the craft and commodity was established. Again, it was the Willoughby's who saw the potential for new market opportunity. It took about 11 to 12 tonnes of coal to produce one tonne of glassware. A glassworks was established at Woolerton in 1615, the aim being to use local coal in the glassmaking process. The glass was then to be sold on the London market. Not surprisingly, it was transport costs that still govern the operations of the Woolerton Glassworks. It would cost one pound two shillings and seven pence to transport a tonne of Woolerton glass to sell in London. The quality of the finished glassware could not justify that cost and make a profit. The enterprise was not successful and had to be closed by 1617. In 1597, the Byrons of Newstead, a well-established Nottingham family, had entered the coal business when they obtained coal-bearing lands around Strelly. In 1601, the Byrons decided that allowing others to run their pits for a rental was better than undertaking the work themselves. The Willoughbys made the same decision regarding some of their pits near to Woolerton. Huntington and Nicholas Bowman, father and son, took the Willoughbys premises on a 21 year lease. In 1604, Huntington Bowman undertook to deliver 7,000 loads of coal to Nottingham annually, but meeting this target proved impossible. For much of the 17th century, the coal industry around Nottingham went into decline. Perhaps it had grown too quickly and expected too much, but the coal was still in the ground and it hadn't been the coal owners who had suffered. By and large, they simply had to foreclose on leases and mortgages. Beaumont's financial backers pulled out, and by 1618 he was imprisoned in Nottingham Gold for debts. We now jump ahead a couple of centuries to move from what was basically a coal scavenging industry satisfying the domestic coal requirements of the growing Nottinghamshire towns. We now consider the industrialisation of the mining process to keep pace with the massive demand for energy during the Industrial Revolution.
The industrialisation of coal mining in Nottinghamshire meant that the mines had to go deep. Nottinghamshire had considerable reserves of coal in the western part of the county that went deeper as they went to the east. If we draw a line roughly on the border between Nottinghamshire and Derbyshire, we can see that the Derbyshire coal was easier to reach, but in Nottingham you had to dig for it. The shallower mines were in the west, so that's where the Nottinghamshire coal industry tended to concentrate, on the west side of the county. But even so, you had to dig between 600 and 1800 feet to reach the coal seams. However, coal was driving the Industrial Revolution. And around the coal fields grew manufacturing industry. It was still usually cheaper to bring the materials to the coal than it was to take the coal to the materials. Most manufacturing industries seem to show at least a 10 to 1 ratio of advantage to coal in favour of the raw materials that they were using. The county city of Nottingham itself was surrounded by collieries with 20 mining centres in and around the city. The mines had to go deeper than the neighbouring Derbyshire mines so coal was relatively expensive. But Nottingham could also trade on its strategic advantage near the natural routes north and south and east and west. The Trent Valley for the north-south routes and the Foss Ridgeway for the east-west routes. Deep mining created a special breed at the coalface and particular social structures in the families above the ground because most coal mines in the area develop discrete mining villages at the surface. It was almost impossible to empathise with the miners' troglodyte world without being a miner, so the social groupings became very tight and insular. Why did people become miners? Why did whole families go down the pit? Why did second, third and even fourth generations follow their ancestors into the mines? Whilst mining at this time was incredibly dangerous and physically harsh, it was also relatively well rewarded and offered unusual job security. It was usually miners who became miners. Drawing coal in industrial quantities required steam-driven head workings, bringing hundreds of tons of coal up during the mining shift and taking the shift miners in and out of the mine in numbers of 20 or 30 instead of twos and threes. The shaft usually dropped into a main gallery with 8 or 12 foot of headroom and quite wide passages for marshal the mine's comings and goings. However, moving to the coal face usually meant the headroom came down until walking required a stoop and then progress had to be made by crawling. Then for some of the narrower seams you could only be working them by lying on your side or your back. If you look closely at this picture, you'll see that there's a miner on the left hand side in an unusual squatting position as he works his pick and a miner on the right hand side who's lying down on his side and shoulder and working his pick to draw the coal. Mines were always hot always damp and most often cramped. 
but every member of the family could find employment at the mine. The younger men of the family as miners and hewers of coal, the older men as colliers and tubbers, and working on the surface handling the logistics of coal. A collier is anyone who handles coal at any stage in the process that isn't cutting it from the coal face or burning it in the furnace. Children could also work as drawers and pushers or foals, handling the coal trucks, baskets and skips from the coal face to the lifts. A foal is a young child who was working with an adult miner. And women and girls could also work underground, acting as pushers and mules. And bringing fluids and snapping for the men at the coalface. A sort of vivandière. In 1842, women and girls were banned from working underground by Act of Parliament, but they could still work as coal sorters, sifters and cleaners at the surface. Sometimes it was only children who could reach the coal, in the narrow seams, and they had to work lying down. And it was usually children who manned the heavy fire doors in the mine, opening them for the tubs to pass through and otherwise keeping them closed to protect the mine from fire. Often each of these jobs would lead to the Stygian terror. Underground, workers often had to provide their own light sources and children were usually only given a short stub of candle. Child labourers would be in the habit of extinguishing their own candles and using that of the men or the light on the tub. There can be no place on earth that is darker than a deep mine without a light. You cannot see your hand when it's only two inches in front of your face. Literally total darkness. And children of six or seven years of age waited in apprehension for the coming of the light. In 1900, an Act of Parliament banned children from working underground. The comradeship and tight team spirit of the shift gang was like that of a ship's crew of sailors. And the miners got to go home and see their wives and families at the end of the shift. And unlike a ship, where the captain or even the admiral could see almost your every move, it was almost certain you would never see a coal master down his pit. The bosses underground were usually mining men themselves who had been promoted. And in the village, the cottage usually came with the job. The village was divided by beliefs, ambitions, aspirations, diligence and thrift. But it was united against any threat or menace with clear rules and laws of its own. If you were lucky, you had an allotment to grow fresh fruit and veg. If you weren't, you relied on the company store and hoped your credit was good. If you were lucky, you had a one-holer, just up the yard from your back door. If you weren't, you shared with ten other families, read the sheets of paper and made it a meeting place. 
If you were lucky, you had your own pump for fresh water. If you were unlucky, you shared the communal wash house. If you were lucky, your missus had a hot tin bath for you to come home to. If you weren't, you had a cold swill in a bucket. The village always divided between church and chapel and pubs and clubs. And rarely did the two meet socially. The village divided between those looking for self-improvement and those having a good old time. And the village divided between those who were careful and thrifty and those who spent as they earned. The company cottage was a two up and two down whether you had a family of three or four, or a family of thirteen or fourteen. If you were a charge hand, you could earn an extra room in a smarter terrace. And if you were made up to an overseer, you could live in what looked like luxury. But you would never come near the owner's lifestyles. The village became united against all injustice, whether it was the injustice of the owners or the overbearing use of authority or a bullying braggart in the village. Against all adversity, they believed that unity was strength. When the First World War came, miners volunteered in their thousands. Some soldier miners brought a new weapon to the front line as they dug massive explosive mines under the German lines. And those who did not join the army continued the supply of coal that was needed for industry, the navy and the home front. When the peace came, the mine owners wanted to normalise their profits even during times of economic instability. This often resulted in wage reductions for miners in their employ. In 1926, the miners tried to retaliate and called the general strike. But the country needed coal and the general strike failed. The miners went back to the coal face where conditions had not improved. Mining always involved headings, drives, galleries and pillars. With millions of tons of rock above, you could not take everything out of the mine. You had to leave pillars to support the roof. In some places, the heading, which was the front end of driving into the coal seam, was narrow and the drive was short. The owners still controlled the flow of coal and could adjust the technical information of the mine to suit the amount of coal they wanted to bring up. And that meant they could control the distribution of coal much as the oil shakes can control oil today. Then came World War II and Ernie Bevin gave some young men an option. Miner or soldier?
My word, they do look young. When the war was over, working conditions had to improve. Housing had to get better. Mine safety had to improve. And the general conditions of the mines had to look more modern. To recover from the war, coal had become a strategic resource for the country. There was a need for consistent and reliable supplies of coal at stable and affordable prices, so that budgets could be planned. At the same time, the owners now saw coal as a major cash cow. Their plan was usually to minimise investment and maximise profits. Supply was often interrupted as the owners exercised and demonstrated their power against the workers to keep costs down and against the government to keep prices up. Regardless of whether the coal owners went underground or not, they could always control the coal on the surface and they could always control the coal that they sold, to whom and at what price. The coal owners decided not to invest in improved conditions of working and work. But after the war, a socialist government under Clement Attlee decided it was time to change the ownership. They had to avoid idleness in the workforce as soldiers returned to a land that was supposed to be fit for heroes. The owners would be bought out by compulsory purchase. The improvements in working conditions had to come now. The coal industry now belonged to the National Coal Board on behalf of the people. The coal owners were always able to control the amount of coal they wanted to see on the ground, and few politicians, at least until the empowerment of the Labour Party, knew exactly how that coal got there. Britain's coal strategy had come largely from people who were either intensely self-interested or ill-informed or even worse were misinformed. So the next great step was a somewhat ambitious and fragile plan. The National Coal Board. For nationalisation to work, all the parties involved needed to come together. That is to say, the ex-owners, the miners' leaders, the miners' unions, the government, the government's advisers, and the intended board of management for the National Coal Board. They all needed to come together to formulate the new national plan. The history of the coal industry meant that that could never be allowed to happen. The coal industry was nationalised. That means you could say that the miners now own the coal. The owners of the coal were going down the pit to mine the coal every shift. The National Coal Board nationalised British coal in January 1947. But the British coal industry could never be truly nationalised. The coal owners had never ever owned a national asset. 
they had their own particular pits. And every mine was different, needing different working methods and yielding different coals. Some coal was good for liquefaction and conversion to town gas and petrochemicals. Some coal could be coked and some coal burnt straight into the furnaces and ovens. And each different coal had its own uses and its own price. And the price had little to do with the cost of getting it up from the ground. But the National Coal Board were investing. With new machines and working methods, the headings could be driven in more effectively. And the galleries stripped more efficiently. And the coal taken out more quickly. But the market for coal was changing. Some of the users had switched to other fuels, and even the major users, like the power industry, were able to use much cheaper coals because of improvements in their burning techniques. For the mine workers and the NCB, the cost of coal was dependent on mine workers' wages, the materials that they needed to work the mine, and the machinery that went down the mine. The price was said to be that cost plus a reasonable profit margin. But unfortunately, the price that the market was prepared to pay depended much more on the value of the coal. And the value of coal was in decline. Pits had always closed when they had outlived their useful lives, but with the coming of the National Coal Board, it was seen that miners should be allowed to stay in their pits, or at least be moved to local pits so that they did not have to up their family and move to a different part of the country. Some miners felt so strongly about this that they would walk out of the mines if closure was threatened. They turned their backs on the economics of mining and began to hatch plans which would lead eventually to a very strong opposition. The miners truly acted as owners when they left their mines to interrupt the nation's supply of coal. And then the battle lines were drawn. Usually the dispute was one of shouting and banner waving and shaking of fists. Occasionally a little argy bargy broke out and sometimes it looked like a battle. In fact, sometimes it looked like a war. The Nottinghamshire miners had always understood that their deep coal was harder won than that of Derbyshire and South Yorkshire. The nationalised coal could never mean an equal opportunity and reward in a nationalised industry as far as the Nottinghamshire miners were concerned. Their coal would either have to be subsidised or they would have to accept lower wages and lower investment for the winning of their coal. The Nottinghamshire miners bravely went against the national mood. Nottinghamshire went back to work, and it really was a brave decision. For the Union of Democratic Mine Workers in the Nottingham section, unity is strength was their motto. But you can see that these ladies from Barnsley 
did not agree with the way that the Nottinghamshire miners defined the word unity. Even to get to work, the miners required a police escort and almost an armoured bus. And the battle was fought to the bitter end. But the end was obvious. Coal was in decline. Nationally, the miners' union lost and the pits all over Britain began to close down. Where will you get a job when you're a wanted lad? Probably not down the mine. But in recognition of their stand, the Nottinghamshire miners were allowed to buy the rights to some of the mines that might have closed. Probably the first true owner miners in history. But the problem wasn't national coal. It was by now international coal. And at the same time, the use of coal became politically incorrect and British coal died. Home production of coal had steadily declined since 1960s. As imports of foreign coal, poorer quality but cheaper, gradually increased from 1970 onwards. By 2020, almost all coal used in Britain was imported. Human beings valued coal before these lands were even a country. When the lands were just a place to follow the reindeer, nap flints and spear fish, to cook in a hotter and more consistent heat of coal. These people were not coal miners, but they were certainly coal gatherers. Many thousands of years later, when the land had become a country and the country recognised a county called Nottinghamshire, the great, great, great to the umpteenth grandchildren of these people became the last official coal gatherers in the county, the country and on the land. King Coal has died. A long tradition has ended. So, this has been another attempt to keep us together whilst we have to be apart. Hopefully there will be another Muscom History Group programme coming out soon. Don't forget, Brian is happy to take your requests if there is a topic you would like us to try. In the meantime, I'm afraid it's still the same request. Be careful, be safe, stay home, stay healthy. We really do want to see you all again when this is over. Thanks again for watching. Goodbye now.